All right, today I'm going to talk about 401k and retirement accounts and how you can use them to invest in real estate. I've seen a lot of videos about 401ks and how you can use them for real estate investing, but really a lot of them are not going into enough details. I'm a detailed guy. I like people to kind of like get me a little bit more detail so that I know exactly what I need to do. And I'm hoping that this video is going to accomplish this. So my name is Eric Martel. I'm a real estate investor and entrepreneur. I've uh, invested in over a thousand single family rentals over the last uh, 10 years. I can currently invest and flip single family rentals about 50 a month with uh, Martel Turnkey, my company. I also have another company called Flip System that uh, basically help people that want to invest in real estate by giving them online training, coaching, as well as connecting them with the team on the ground. This is also uh, another company that I have. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a real estate investor, and I'm actively participating in real estate investing. So every week I do videos to help people invest in real estate and maximize the use of cash so they can achieve financial freedom. Enough of that, let's get in the meat of it. 401k, so before I get started, let's talk about custodian, right? Custodian is a, a term, basically, it's a third party entity, it's kind of like a bank and whatnot, and their role is to do two things, is hold your assets, whether it's a stock, the, the actual shares of companies, your money, uh, whatever that is, and they also make sure that you are following the rules that the IRS has set for them. So if you're thinking about the stock market, for example, you would be thinking about something like Schwab, TD Ameritrade. These would be custodians. So they're holding the shares of the company that you bought. They're holding your money. If you have mutual funds, any kind of things like that, they're holding. Now, depending on the type of accounts that you have, then they're also going to control what you do with that money. So if you have a retirement account with them, they will know what that account is. They will know what the rules are associated with that account. And they will control that, make sure that you're following the rules that the U.S. have set up. So this is kind of like the compliance uh, part of it. Now, if I'm going to invest in real estate, I can't go to Schwab and invest in real estate. I have to find a different type of custodian, a different type of third party entity that's going to hold my assets, my investments, and is going to also ensure that I am compliant with the IRS and whatever rules I have. So I would have to transfer this money into this other couple of custodians that I know of. There might be other ones is directed IRA. Another one is equity trust is trust etc.com. So these are the two uh, that I know about uh, where they can help you invest in real estate from your 401k or your IRA. So you would need to transfer that money into that to that custodian. You would have to pay taxes or anything like that. It would be transferred from tax deferred retirement account into another tax deferred retirement account. So it wouldn't be considered a distribution, no taxes being paid, and then you would be able to invest in there. Now let's talk about self-directed IRA. So this is what I'm going to call these this group of so it could be a self-directed 401k, a retirement account. I'm going to call all of those self-directed IRA. So these are the ones that would be with these, uh, these custodians. So these self-directed IRA are a separate entity. They're not you, they own assets, they own property, they're the one that invests. Yes, you are directing their investment, but technically it's not your investment, it's that entity, that self-directed IRA that's doing the investment. It is a little bit kind of like an LLC or an S-Corp, except there's a lot more rules associated with that because of that tax deferment component. One of those rules is around, kind of like at the broad level, is you don't want to have any personal benefit from that self-directed IRA. So and we're going to go into the details of that, but as an example, the self-directed IRA cannot own a property, a house that you rent from the self-directed IRA, because then you would be able to take advantage of the self-directed IRA, maybe giving you a lower rent or maybe giving you a higher rent or whatever, so that you would have some personal benefit from that. Again, like I mentioned, the yes, uh, self-directed IRA owns the assets, not you. When we talk about these things, so there's kind of two things. There's like the prohibited transactions that you can't do with the uh, self-directed IRA and also the people that you can't deal with. So let's start about the prohibited transaction. So you can't sell, buy, or exchange in any way 
properties between the sales director, the IRA, and you or the people that are disqualified, right? We're going to talk about who these disqualified people are, but you can't do that, right? I mean, they don't want you to game the system. They don't want you to, you know, buy something super expensive and then sell it on the cheap on the back end or vice versa, and then somehow inflate one or the other and be able to extract money from the 401k by tricking and gaming the system. So that's that's the, the idea there. Also, no lending. So they don't want any lending to the sell directed IRA or from the sell directed IRA to you. Again, same situation. Don't want any, uh, any kind of gaming going on, any kind of self-dealing. Also, you can't use the asset. So you can't go and rent from it. If you have like an Airbnb that the sell directed IRA is renting out of like a cottage in Tahoe, you can't go and use it. Or even if you're renting, even if you're paying rent for it, you can't do that with an asset that's owned by the sell directed IRA because that would be a personal benefit. You can't use the sell directed IRA assets as collateral, obviously, because they're not your assets. They belong to the self directed IRA. And imagine that this self directed IRA is a separate person. It's kind of like your neighbor. You can't just go and ask your neighbor and say, hey, can I use your car as collateral for my loan? Or can I use your house as collateral for my loan? You know, you wouldn't be doing that. It's the same kind of thing with the self-directed IRA. You also can't get compensation. Technically you can, it has to be very limited and blah, blah, blah. I prefer to say, don't get any compensation from managing anything about the self-directed IRA. So one of the things that you have to be careful about in all the transaction is liquidity concern. So you can see that it's very hard to get assets and money and stuff like that in and out of the self-directed IRA. So you want to make sure that you have enough liquidity in there if you're going to do any kind of real estate transaction. So this is just, just one thing to note. We're going to talk about that in a minute also. Now, so these are kind of the prohibited transactions. So let's talk about disqualified people. Obviously, you as the self-directed IRA owner, you cannot do any transaction. We already talked about that between you and the self-directed IRA directly, but also you can't do anything in the family and that means a direct family. So you can't do any, any dealings with your parents, with your grandparents. You cannot also do it with your children or your grandchildren. So it's kind of like a straight line down. You can't actually do transaction with your brother, your cousins, you know, on the other side, on the horizontal side, you can do it. It's just not on the vertical side. The other thing is entities that you control, any kind of entities that you own more than 50% of, then you can't do any kind of transactions with that. And the reason is pretty obvious. Again, it's about self-dealing. Let's talk about structure. So it is perfectly feasible to actually have the self-directed IRA invest and lend money to third parties, uh, do joint ventures, invest in real estate directly from the self-directed IRA. So it's totally possible to do that. Is it the best way to do that? I would say no. I would prefer to have the self-directed IRA actually invest the money into an LLC, and then that LLC has the investment um, you know, with whatever they're doing. So a couple of advantage to this is that once you invest with the self-directed IRA directly, whenever you want to have money come out of the self-directed IRA, the custodian has to issue the check. So you have to basically fill out a form and sign it. You have to give them documents showing where you're gonna invest the money and, and they're gonna go and review it and make sure that you're compliant. Then they're gonna ask, send the money to the investor or whatever that you're lending the money to. It's a little bit more cumbersome. It could take five, 10 days sometimes to get everything organized and have the money actually appear in the bank account of your investor. Not ideal, not that great, uh, but the nice thing about it is that you know you're compliant because the custodian has verified to the best of their ability that this is a compliant transaction. Now, the other way is to have uh, something that's more like what they call checkbook control. So you have the self-directed IRA invest in an LLC, create an LLC specifically for the self-directed IRA. The IRA actually owns 100% of the LLC. The LLC has a bank account. You're the manager of the LLC. And then you can write checks from that LLC to do any kind of investment you want. So it could be lending money, it could be doing joint ventures, it could be also owning real estate, single family rentals or whatever. 
any kind of real estate investment that you want to do. The other advantage of that is kind of when you are retiring, how are you going to extract the money from yourself directly to IRA if you own real estate? So that's the trick. You have like a $200,000 house and maybe you don't want to sell that house. So instead of selling the house, you can basically give a percentage of the LLC to yourself, reassign it to yourself and start getting the net cash flow from that. It is a taxable event. You're going to have to pay taxes on the value of that LLC that you are giving yourself because it's going to be a distribution, but you're going to be have control of a percentage of the LLC at that point, And then you'll be able to continue doing that. Which brings to my other point is that it is perfectly allowed for the, you and the self-directed IRA to invest in the LLC. So let's say you invest 50 in the LLC, then everything has to be split exactly 50-50. So any kind of income, expenses, net profit, net cash flow, all these things have to be split based on the membership. So you have to be very clear about that. If you kind of like deviate from that, this could be some trouble. So that means that, again, this comes back to the liquidity concern. You want to make sure that you have enough money. So let's say you're investing in a, in a single family rental and then that single family rental, the rehab budget, we need an extra $10,000. The LLC doesn't have the money. I have the money. Now, if I want to put more money in, I can't just go and put more money in. I have to basically buy some shares of the LLC. I have to do something in order to put put money into that, that bank account so that I can pay for the renovation. So there has to be some kind of fair transaction. I can imagine that that self-directed IRA is your neighbor investor in that LLC. You want to make it fair for that investor. So a lot of things uh, there that's important to consider, but yeah, totally possible to have an LLC where you are an investor individually. And then you also have your self-directed IRA as an investor and make sure that it's fair all the way through. You can do distribution or, you know, changing the membership later on. It's going to be a taxable event. And then you would have to pay taxes on that. Next things, leverage. So yes, can you do leverage on a, uh, on a house with a self-directed IRA? Yes, it is possible. There are restrictions on that. So basically I'm going to assume that there's an LLC, it's 100% owned by the self-directed IRA, just for simplicity. So it has to be a non-recourse loan. This is a strong requirement here. You have to have a non-recourse loan. And from that, that means there's a lot of other issues that happen. So the loan-to-value ratio is also going to be much lower for these self-directed IRA. So it's going to be probably around 30 to 50% loan-to-value ratio, higher interest rate, shorter amortization periods, shorter terms, also higher fees. And then on top of that, you might also be subjected to the UDFI tax, which means for the portion of the property that's getting net cash flow, that you might have to pay some UDFI taxes on the portion that you're getting the loan from. So if you're getting a loan with 30% loan to value ratio, so maybe 30% of that profit would actually be taxable normal big concern here whenever you have a loan is liquidity you want to make sure you have enough liquid cash to basically cover any kind of issues that there might be if the sell director runs out of money you can't put money in so you have to be very careful you have to have a big cushion to handle any kind of expenses you don't want to go in default either so all, all kinds of problems. From my perspective, when you look at this, basically the benefit of doing the loan that you would normally uh, have, the benefit of leverage in a normal situation, if you were to do it outside of the self-directed IRA, they're kind of negated because of all the stuff that's going on. And your ROI is actually not going to be that great. So I would probably recommend not to deal with any kind of leverage if you're going to invest in real estate actually owning a real estate asset within your self-directed IRA. So, but self-directed IRA obviously has some tax advantages. And this is kind of like, what do we invest in with your self-directed IRA? On one side, you know, self-directed IRA is a tax advantage vehicle, tax deferred benefit. So I would want to put things that where I can't hide the, my profit. It is impossible for me to kind of like use depreciation or anything like that. Compared to my personal taxes, 
where I, if I can have a loss and reduce my tax liability, that's the kind of thing that I would want to have. So if you own a single family rentals that's cash flowing or something like that, then maybe you have depreciation on top of that. Depreciation is a tax advantage. When you put that in the self-directed IRA, it doesn't make that much sense because you're, you're having this depreciation and then it's kind of in a tax deferred account anyway. Actually, able to say you do a bonus depreciation, you have a loss basically that year because of the bonus depreciation, but it doesn't make sense to have it in the self-directed IRA. You would want to have it in your personal taxes so you can offset and reduce your taxes. So owning the property long-term in the self-directed IRA doesn't make a lot of sense. The only reason why it makes sense is this is where all your money is and you have no choice, kind of. You are forced to use it for, uh, for that purpose. Otherwise, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. You're better off to do these investments outside of the self-directed IRA. Next is private money lending. If I want to lend personally, I can't hide it. I'm going to get a 1099 at the end of the year for the interest income that, and I'm going to have to report it and as income and I, there's nothing I can do about it. But I can lend from my self-directed IRA and that income, that profit would not be taxable. That's a perfect vehicle, a perfect way to invest out of the self-directed IRA. Same thing with joint ventures. So the profit or capital gains that I would get from a joint venture, I would have to report them on my personal taxes. But if I report them on my self-directed IRA, I don't pay taxes on that. Now let's talk about flipping houses. So flipping houses, great. I'm definitely gonna make money flipping houses. This is good. So technically I would think, oh, I wanna put it on the self-directed IRA side. Now, the problem is the IRS is going to look at this and going to say, well, if you're flipping houses out of your self-directed IRA, you're really operating a business within your self-directed IRA, and then we're going to tax you on that income. They're not going to cancel your IRA. They're just going to say that, hey, you know what, this income is actually taxable because you're running the business out of that. So for flipping houses, it probably make more sense to do this out of your personal side and not put that into your self-directed IRA. Bottom line, if you have a self-directed IRA, if you want to invest in real estate, my recommendation is to do private money lending, do joint venture. If you have a lot of money and you just can't invest it all into the private money lending or joint ventures, and you want to buy and hold single family rentals or other real estate assets that are cash flowing, then yeah, you can definitely do that within your self-directed IRA. I would recommend, obviously, not do anything like the flipping within your self-directed IRA. It doesn't make really a lot of sense. So, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you want to talk about, if you have any kind of like additional things that you want to talk about with respect to 401k and other self-directed IRA, please put some comments in, uh, in below and I will try to answer them. Thank you very much.